Would you go to an amusement park where someone died each year? This is essentially the question asked by comedian Gareth Reynolds on the popular podcast The Dollop, while listening to his friend and fellow comic Dave Anthony tell him the story of Action Park. The notorious New Jersey water park at one point was responsible for the deaths of six park attendees over seven years. Not quite one death per year, but inarguably six too many deaths for seven years, or even 17 years, dare I say 70 years. And we're not speaking of situations where someone could have died anywhere and just happened to be at the park. Someone was due for a heart attack or suffered an aneurysm, for instance, something along those lines. These were incidents where someone very, very likely survives if they had never come to Action Park. One thing Action Park officials tried to point to in their defense at the time was that its mortality rate was comparatively low, and in terms of strict numbers, their defense is, let's say, not inaccurate, and could be applied for any park over just about any time period. One death per 100,000 visitors would make a park considerably safer than the drive to the park, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which reported that in 2019, the vehicle mortality rates in the United States were approximately 11 deaths per 100,000 people and 15 deaths per 100,000 registered drivers. And bear in mind, Action Park, like any other popular amusement park, received far more than 100,000 visitors annually. So its mortality rate was much better than the baseline I just used of one per 100,000. To dive a little deeper into this, in 2021, Six Flags Parks nationwide recorded 28 million total visitors, which is actually down 5 million from the number of guests they received pre-pandemic. So let's go ahead and round that figure up to an even 30 million. With that number in mind, if one guest died annually at any Six Flags theme park in the country, not one at each park, but one at all of them combined, that would give you a 0.000003% chance of dying while amusing yourself at the Six Flags of your choosing. Monumentally minuscule odds of meeting your fate due to some roller coaster mishap or what have you. And yet, if one person per year, one out of 30 million, died in an accident at Six Flags for three or four consecutive years, wouldn't people start saying something is wrong with these parks? Wouldn't they ask, why does this keep happening? To put a finer point on it, going back to our arbitrary 1 in 100,000 baseline that's 11 times better than traffic mortality rates, if that applied to the 30 million annual Six Flags visitors, it would come out to 300 deaths in a park caused accident per year. They probably would have to shut down the parks. This connects to the original question. Would you go to an amusement park where someone died each year? For many people, their answer would be a firm no. And to be fair to amusement parks, the same would apply to other things we hold to a near impeccable safety standard. The FAA states that it handles about 1.3 million flights per month. And if there was a major fatal plane crash in the United States for four months in a row, most of us wouldn't be saying, well, it's still less than one in a million. We'd be asking what the hell is going on with the airline industry. A number of us would stop flying. Back to the theme parks, per an article in Grunge, there may have been up to 51 deaths of park employees and guests in the half-century history of Disney World in Orlando as of 2018. At that time, that would have averaged out to a little more than one death per year. However, and not to sound callous on the subject of someone losing their life, there are critical caveats. The article says that these deaths are the results of, quote, incidents including workplace industrial accidents, failure of guests abiding by safety guidelines, underlying medical conditions contributing to deaths, a gruesome alligator attack that killed a young boy, and everything in between, end quote. The way that sentence is written, you'd think that a significant majority of the deaths were the result of some horrific park negligence. 
But that nebulous, quote, everything in between looms rather large. Grunge's source for its statistics is a Quora.com discussion, where one person points out early on that many of the deaths were the result of heart attacks or primarily influenced by underlying conditions, and zero were due to ride malfunctions. This is a far cry from the deaths that occurred at a place like Action Park, where one man was electrocuted by an exposed underwater wire, another was killed when the ride he was on jumped the track, Another suffered a heart attack when he landed in a body of water that may have been as cold as 50 degrees Fahrenheit, cold enough to induce fatal shock per weather.gov, and there were three others who drowned in a wave pool so treacherous, park employees nicknamed it the Grave Pool. Now, I'm hardly a Disney shill, that's exactly what a Disney shill would say, at least one person is probably thinking. But I've never been to any Disney theme park in my life, and overall, I'm at least wary of the company's impact on the movie industry. But based on the same source used by Grunge, I'd say the majority of deaths at their parks were unfortunate coincidences. When you have a small town's worth of people on site, many of them older and dealing with prior health issues, it's not too out of the ordinary if one or two people happen to be scheduled to die while they're visiting you. There's a difference between a place where, by and large, someone might happen to die, and a place that can routinely prove the cause of someone's death. Again, in the latter situation, many of us would opt out of going there. Yet we don't stay off the roads despite them being far, far more dangerous than any theme park. Roads, however, are also far less optional and, for many of us, certainly not recreational, at least not entirely. To get your license, you have to take a class that in some way emphasizes safety. We have safety-related signs lined up frequently alongside the road and various penalties associated with breaking the rules of the road, ranging from fines to possible imprisonment. We want roads to be safer because they must be traveled. They have a purpose. Yet deep within us, we accept that driving is inherently a little dangerous. We understandably don't accept that about amusement parks. Despite a primary purpose of many amusement parks, state fairs, and traveling carnivals, and their featured attractions, being that they allow us to court danger, or other things we may fear, in some way. High speeds and high altitudes, fast and frequent falls, dizzying twists and spins, to say nothing of frightful fun houses. Not everyone goes to a theme park, fair, or carnival for the thrill rides. Some enjoy the food, the games, the displays and exhibitions, or performances. Although even some performances let you witness scenes of peril. Especially some of the older, carny attractions that are rarer today. Knife throwing, fire eating, and the like. Watching such things might not generate the same physical exhilaration as the rides that employ velocity and gravity to launch and or drop you, or those that do this while attacking your equilibrium. But a death-defying performance can still summon a gasp from the audience, sometimes more. Taking all of these things into consideration, it's no wonder that no stock audio of a carnival is complete without people screaming. Traveling carnivals, in particular, have been sources of fear and inspiration for frightening stories for almost as long as they have existed. When not acting as the director of a psychiatric hospital, Dr. Caligari, namesake of one of the earliest horror films, moonlights at a local fair showcasing a somnambulist to locals. The 1946 novel Nightmare Alley explores the inner workings and shady side of carnival life. In 1962, the cult classic Carnival of Souls was released, a film that could have been set anywhere but specifically chose a carnival. In more recent times, the unfinished HBO series Carnival and the American horror story season Freak Show dove headlong into natural and supernatural horrors suffered and created by those colloquially known as carnies. As attracted as people have always been to the traveling carnival spectacle, they've also been suspicious of the people who bring the festivities to their town. 
They're easy to blame for criminal activity that takes place while they're in town, whether they're the likely culprits or not, precisely because they are nomads and outsiders. Back in season one of this podcast, I talked both about the fear of being the outsider and the fear of outsiders, and both can apply to the people who bring the fair to your neck of the woods. Certain attractions and games at traveling carnivals are designed with a certain amount of deception in mind, from palm readers and psychics to ring toss games. Even some of the somewhat harmless escapism at a carnival is still, in some way, profitable primarily because of what could be considered cheating and or lying. And traveling carnivals have attracted active criminals looking for a way out of town or a place to hide. But they have also attracted people simply trying to make it, who are looking for somewhere they belong. They've also attracted prejudice and persecution. From a basic practical standpoint though, taking a moment to consider the rides featured at carnivals, there is valid cause to fear putting your trust in these professionals, even though, as we have established, any kind of fatal accident on a thrill ride is a relative rarity. Think of it for a second. Would you trust a car that was regularly disassembled and then reassembled as it was taken from place to place across the country? Granted, we've talked about how much riskier driving can be, but at least you would still have some level of control if you were behind the wheel. You can pull over if things feel unsafe. You have zero control over the frequently deconstructed and reconstructed roller coasters, Ferris wheels, tilt-a-whirls, zippers, I hate that one, and other rides that are seemingly a moment of attention, complacency, laziness, poor training, or just bad luck away from becoming a poorly built death trap. If things feel wrong or out of place once the ride starts, all you can do is scream for someone to stop the ride and help you and hope to be heard above all the other screaming. But I don't want to make it sound like traveling carnivals are the only potential sources of danger and fear with respect to thrill rides. I've lived in San Antonio long enough to remember when its theme park wasn't owned by Six Flags and was just called Fiesta Texas. Its centerpiece roller coaster, a steel coaster now called the Iron Rattler, was once a wooden coaster just called the Rattler. Even well after I got over my fear of heights enough to ride roller coasters, courtesy of a trip with a church youth group to the now no more Astral World in Houston, where I was determined not to look too afraid in front of a girl I liked, I still never rode the Rattler. Not because it was any taller than any other coaster I'd been on, or because I had heard from people who rode it that the ride was pretty rough. No, I never rode the Rattler because the first three or four times I visited Fiesta, Texas, I always saw someone working on it. Up there, harnessed to the wooden beams, employing a hammer or wrench or other tools, presumably to tighten up something that had gotten loose or secure some pieces before they could come undone. In a way, that maintenance probably should have been more reassuring. Maybe they were just doing preemptive and even superfluous work, to prevent the ride from really needing the fixes it merely looked like people were working on. Maybe I should have been warier of the rides where I never saw anyone doing any work. But no, rightly or wrongly, I have always figured that proper park maintenance was conducted outside of operating hours, and work done in the middle of the day, in full view of park patrons, had to be urgent, didn't it? Well. No, it didn't, or at least I'm not knowledgeable enough on the subject to say so one way or the other. And it could have been entirely coincidental that I saw the Rattler worked on so often while never seeing anyone actively working on any of the other coasters. Being aware of that has never stopped me from being afraid of the Rattler, and even of its newer, much more stable and metallic descendant. I've never seen anyone working on the Iron Rattler in my visits to the park. I'm still content to never ride it. Irrational as it is, I still imagine seeing a man tightening bolts or driving nails when I look up at the thing, and then just go on to other rides that conjure no such imagery. On the more deliberately frightening side of things, Fiesta Texas, like many amusement parks around the country and the world, 
turns itself into a bit of a grand spooky spectacle every October, in the spirit of Halloween. This keeps with the tradition born with the dark rides that were first set upon the world in the 19th century. An overly literal version of a dark ride appears in fiction in the classic Asimov story Nightfall, which I referenced in episode 2 of season 1, looking at our fear of the dark. Real-world dark rides aren't just short, slow treks through complete darkness, and some aren't even necessarily designed to be scary. The classic Tunnel of Love is, by definition, a dark ride. But so are the old ghost train rides that found popularity in the early 20th century, or attractions like the Disneyland staple, The Haunted Mansion. Darkness itself needn't even be a primary feature in rides built to elicit screams without the need for speed, altitude, or sudden movements. For years, the signature attraction at the Universal Studios theme park in Florida was the Jaws ride, which didn't drop you from X number of stories up or send you careening down a tight tunnel with abrupt turns. It was just a slow build on a boat ride that passed briefly through the dark, all while setting you up for a big jump scare that happened in broad daylight. The idea of a theme park or carnival attraction built to exploit your fears even while keeping you close to the ground or in a stable slow ride is older than anyone alive today. It is old and universal enough to make the word funhouse synonymous with fear for some people. Just to drive this particular point home, I'd like to point out that in the midst of making films with the blatantly horrifying titles of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Eaten Alive, and even Poltergeist, Toby Hooper made a film simply titled The Fun House, and the director's pedigree was not the only reason nobody was going to mistake that title for a family-friendly comedy. Carnivals in general have long been a quick way to enhance a story's horror. Earlier, I mentioned the cult classic horror film Carnival of Souls. It doesn't spend as much time at the titular carnival as you might think. And again, considering where the story takes us, it truly could have taken place anywhere other than the carnival. It could have easily been Cathedral of Souls or Highway of Souls, but the carnival setting is no less apt than any other place with a long history of alleged hauntings, curses, mysteries, and more. From Christmasland in Joe Hill's Nosferatu, to the somewhat similar Holiday House in Clive Barker's The Thief of Always, from the futuristic Westworld to the grungy extended home of the Firefly family in House of a Thousand Corpses, from the Twilight Zone episode Perchance to Dream, to the flawed but watchworthy Malatesta's Carnival of Blood, to the climax of the 1959 film Horrors of the Black Museum. Authors, filmmakers, and more have given us carnival horrors galore. And I haven't even spent time on the old freak shows and geek shows, subjects that I'm not entirely comfortable discussing with respect to our fears, given that they place actual human beings at the center of the spectacle in a way that, even if it may have been the only work available for some people in the past, and not something that they are ashamed of, still can't help but be at least somewhat exploitative, if not egregiously so. That's a topic for another day at minimum, another podcast altogether most likely. What I will talk about next, instead, is the first story that comes to my mind when I think of frightening fairs, carnivals, and theme parks. A story whose echoes appear in the aforementioned works of Joe Hill and Clive Barker. I like to go off the beaten path every so often, as you know if you are a constant listener. But sometimes you just have to go with the story that a lot of people know and love. For this episode, it is Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes. Light and Dark, Day and Night the holy versus the unholy. Bradbury's novel is not designed to be subtle. If you know me, then you know by now that that's not a knock. To paraphrase my favorite John Carpenter quote, you only hide the devil in your work if it's a stupid looking devil. 
If you have a good-looking devil that will scare the audience, then hell yes, you show it. The devil in Something Wicked This Way Comes could not be more conspicuous. As he puts it when he introduces himself to Jim Nightshade and Will Halloway, his name is Dark. Literally. Mr. Dark of Cougar and Dark's combined shadow shows and cross-continental pandemonium theater company. He is tall, pale, and he wears a suit that somehow looks like it's littered with thorns under certain lighting. He also introduces himself as the Illustrated Man, a reference to an earlier Bradbury short story collection of the same name, in which a man's numerous tattoos each tell a different story, some darker than others. In Something Wicked, the Illustrated Man's tattoos reflect the many lives he has claimed and even allow him to continue exerting power over those people. Bradbury's earliest short story collection is titled Dark Carnival. It is a consistently grimmer, more horrific collection of stories than those found in The Illustrated Man, and includes classics such as Skeleton and the Small Assassin, and lesser-known gems like The Wind, which I covered back in episode 10 of this podcast. It also has the story The Jar, which prominently features a sinister carnival attraction. By the time Bradbury wrote Something Wicked This Way Comes, he was very familiar with the creepy carnival motif and writes the short novel as though his audience ought to be familiar with his familiarity. One of Mr. Dark's first ominous observed acts is operating a carousel, a classic signature ride readily identified with amusement parks, boardwalks, fairs, and carnivals. Dark's evil spin, pun intended, on his merry-go-round is that he has it go backwards while his partner, Mr. Cougar, rides it. It transforms Cougar into a boy. This is just the beginning of Dark's many machinations. In truth, while he employs a modicum of deception, Dark isn't exactly coy. He doesn't believe he needs to be. If you can tempt people with desires they absolutely can't resist, you barely have to pretend not to be evil. Often you don't have to pretend at all. Stories that explore deals with a devil sometimes paint their devil as a deceiver, a con artist who withholds critical conditions of the deal. Or they paint their victim as someone desperate enough to rush into a bad bargain, or someone unequipped to understand the fine print or user agreement. Often we're actually the ones fooling ourselves into thinking any fictional devil would have to work so hard to fool us. In many stories, the deal is actually pretty straightforward. I'm going to get your soul for eternity in exchange for something temporary you feel you can't do without. Short-term thinking and the inability to resist indulging in delights results in people agreeing to the deals. Even when chicanery or misdirection may be involved, it's often all but blatant or well-known, but people still engage nonetheless. We can cite many parallels to this in the real world. On much more of a low-stakes level, we can even see this play out in something as simple as the carnival games I mentioned briefly earlier. Pretty much anyone above the age of adolescence is aware that carnival games are, if not quite rigged, certainly made to appear far more winnable than they actually are. You can find many tutorials online explaining how to win at these games, written as if carnival operators can't look up the same information for themselves and build in counters to the advice in the articles and videos. And of course, it wouldn't make sense from a business perspective for them to allow the games to pay out too often. The same rules apply to casinos, which, come to think of it, have a bit of a carnival atmosphere themselves. In either case, you're putting up something valuable in the hopes of getting something in return, despite the odds being heavily against you at minimum, or unfairly stacked in the house's favor at maximum, and sometimes your possible winnings are not even worth all that you have wagered. Mr. Dark tries to bargain with the story's later stage protagonist, Charles Holloway, a man who feels old at 54 in part because he started a family a little later in life than is the norm. It's easy for Mr. Dark to know what to tempt him with, something you don't even have to be old or feel old to want more of. Years. 
In the book and adaptation, he makes this offer in a way that encourages an urgent, hasty decision. Act fast before the offer worsens, he essentially says. It's a tactic that makes it clear he believes he has all of the leverage. In this way, and many others, Dark and his carnival are like a twisted, funhouse mirror reflection of what a proprietor and his place of amusement ought to be. Fittingly, critical parts of the story find characters facing such mirrors. How could it not? And it's soon after Charles Holloway sees his son's reflection in the mirror maze that he happens to come up with a way to turn the twisted, malformed nature of Dark's pandemonium theater company against itself. As I mentioned before, no stock soundtrack to a carnival setting is complete without the screaming. But it would be incomplete without laughter as well. We frequently seek and find joy and fun in doing things that could be considered frightening. An offshoot of amusement park fun houses are the ubiquitous haunted house attractions that pop up everywhere each Halloween, some of which are popular enough to be year-round attractions. The screaming heard in such places is often accompanied by a smile. Shocked shrieks are often followed by seemingly uncontrollable giggling. The same applies to people on a thrill ride. If you look for pictures of people riding roller coasters, it won't take long at all to see someone who looks like they are screaming and smiling simultaneously. Dark's carnival is sustained by taking the smiling part away. Worse, as Charles tells his son late in the novel, they feed on pain and suffering and will, quote, take your crying and use it for their own smile. End quote. This is a common trait among certain types of supernatural villains, but especially apt for the illustrated man and his ilk. This is an underlying aspect of any Faustian bargain, which is the currency that keeps Dark's Carnival operating. Whatever you gain can't be fully enjoyed because of the horror that hangs over your head due to what you traded away. Dark and his compatriots are so bound to making people frightened and miserable that they are physically vulnerable to happiness. Holloway kills one of Dark's slaves slash partners while taking part in what should be a routinely rigged sideshow trick. The infamous magic bullet trick, which can be dangerous in a number of ways in the real world, in Dark's world of magic is typically safe because its target, a witch, would be invulnerable. In this case, however, her metaphorical silver bullet proves to be an actual bullet marked with a smile. By the end of the book, this goes to stranger and darker places that give a literal meaning to the phrase, kill em with kindness. It gives us a happy ending built around forced happiness that partly involves destroying a child by giving it fatherly affection, thereby starving it of the evil it needs to survive. It's a villainous child, though, so it's fine. Still, you can understand why they went a different route for the adaptation. That would have been a pretty tough sell on the screen. Thematically, though, what's on the page is much more interesting and fitting. The ultimate undoing of the Dark Carnival does not just boil down to the power of love. It comes from countering the corruption of this particular traveling fair embracing the amusement that Dark's Park seeks to erase. One somewhat obvious reason why carnivals make for great horror story settings that I've been holding back on stating plainly is that they can serve a similar purpose to horror stories. They can give us an ideally safe and controlled way to explore and even manage some of our fears. As I said before, I used to be terrified of heights, to the extent that it was a bit of a chore for me to just walk down a flight of stairs. That was before an essentially bigger fear in my teenage years, that of embarrassment, urged me to power through my acrophobia enough to ride my first roller coaster. By the end of that day, I was hoarse from screaming and already thinking of when I could do it all over again. I couldn't get enough of it. I remained selective about the rides I got on going forward, as demonstrated by my wariness of the old wooden version of the Rattler. And I'm still not a fan of heights, 
but those roller coasters at Astro World did a lot to make me no longer feel dizzy at the idea of just getting on an escalator, for instance. Finding a way to have fun with my fear in that setting allowed me to manage it better in other environments and more commonly encountered situations. People scream at scary movies. Children around a campfire might scream at the punchline of a well-told story, and adults and kids alike can be heard screaming at carnivals. Not just because they are scared, but because they are also having the time of their lives. Thank you for listening to the Healthy Fears Podcast, written, produced, and narrated by Johnny Compton. For transcripts and research notes, if applicable, for each episode, visit healthyfears.com. Or if you're interested in my writing, my publication credits, and links to some of my short stories can be found at johnnycompton.com. My debut novel, The Spite House is currently scheduled to be released by Tor Nightfire on February 7th, 2023, and it is available now for pre-order at Barnes & Noble or an independent bookstore near you. Prolific horror veteran Cynthia Palayo, whose novel Children of Chicago is nominated for a Stoker Award this year, says, quote, The Spite House is the modern gothic story full of dread we've all been waiting for. End quote. Thank you to Cynthia for those amazing words, and if that sounds interesting to you, then by all means, feel free to reserve a copy today. The subject of next week's episode is The Fears We May Feel When Traveling on Certain Roads For anyone who is interested. Until then, one way or another, if you make your way to an amusement park, Beware of any carnival barkers advertising attractions similar to those in the 70s soul song Sideshow, which the singer professes are, quote, guaranteed to make you cry. <laughs>